If you'd like, would you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 11, which will be the text we're in this morning. But before we read that text together throughout the morning, I want to read the psalm that was written at the same time. Psalm chapter, or the 51st psalm, where the note for the director of the music was a psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors, transgressors your way and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, and the God who saves me, the tongue, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in the sacrifice, for I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God or a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Let's pray. Father, may we take sin as seriously as David did when Nathan confronted him. May our hearts be broken and contrite before you when we sin, and may we know that it's a contrite heart that can request and receive the ultimate sacrifice of your son. And may we learn to put our hope not in the greatness of of a king like David, but in the hope of his greater son, Jesus. In his name whom we pray, amen. I'm a boring person. I don't know if that's been made clear enough or not. Which means an evening at home with the television is as good as any other. And when it's not something written and written well, there are two reality programs that will catch my attention. The first one is Master Chef Junior. Because the idea of an eight-year-old that somehow can cook a dinner and a meal that can be served at a fine restaurant both intrigues me and annoys me at the same time. <laughs> like, where did this little girl who can't see over the counter learn how to make a dish that I couldn't make in a million years if I would give myself the 45 minutes of prep time that it requires? But the other thing that I enjoy, especially as I'm preparing for a Sunday morning and staying home on Saturday night, is the mysteries of Dateline NBC on, well, NBC. Because it always has the same story. We're introduced to some sort of mystery. And my favorite episode is the one where the Canadian white-haired journalist Keith Morrison is the host. Because Keith has the ability in the two hours to speak in such a creepy way that he both sustains your interest and makes you think that there is suspense and something very dangerous waiting after the commercial break. But the story always has basically three parts. What happened? What exactly the aftermath is? And then what the resolution was? It's almost like the writer of 2 Samuel knew that and he was trying out for Dateline NBC here in chapters 11 and chapters 12. The story which I'm about to tell you happened one night in Jerusalem. And you, you can hear it. We could probably even play the song of David as the introduction over images and visuals. So if you would, would you read with me as we find out the course to the sin of which we will talk about this afternoon or this morning. Psalm, or 2 Samuel chapter 11. 
It was in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war. David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. You can almost hear that in the, in the tone. The kings are supposed to go to war, but this time David stayed behind. David the king, not where he was supposed to be. That will begin our journey towards the sin and the great mystery that will take place in Jerusalem. Because David was not doing what a king is supposed to do. Maybe that's the lesson for us to learn. That when we are not where we're supposed to be, sin may be right around the corner. Or right across the alleyway, as David would find out. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. Oh, but she was a very beautiful woman. Oh, yes. If anybody's seen Dateline, I hope you're noticing the Keith Morrison way this is told. The woman was very beautiful. and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. Oh, an invitation that she should have turned down and he should have never offered. As David went after forbidden fruit, then David sent his messengers to get her. She came to him and oh my, he slept with her. After she had purified herself from her uncleanness, then she went back home. Oh my. So in the time when kings are supposed to go to war, the king stayed at home. And while he sent Uriah the Hittite, one of his mighty men, off to war, David began a relationship with this mighty warrior's wife. But maybe it could just be a one-time thing until there was a message. Then the woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Uh-oh. Now we have our course set. It's a story as old as time of a man with someone else's wife. And the consequences are about to become obvious. The course has been set. Where you're not supposed to be, looking at what not is yours, taking what does not belong to you, and thinking there will be no consequences. If only David had been able to be warned by James, who said, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone, which means the test and temptation is from David himself. Because when each one is tempted by his own will and desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when it is full grown, it gives birth to death. Oh, and the sin of David is going to lead very quickly to death. Because we go from the course of sin to what Bathsheba has set apart by letting them know of the consequences of their sin. What David and Bathsheba did one night is going to be made abundantly clear unless somehow the two can find a way to make it look like something else has occurred. But there's a problem. Uriah is a warrior. He's off where David is supposed to be. He's on the front lines. But David, as king, has the ability to solve the problem. Let's go back to see what happened next. So David sent his word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance of his home to the palace with all his master's servants and he did not go down to his house. When David saw this, 
He was told Uriah did not go home. He asked, haven't you just come from a distance? Why didn't you go home? David decides to try to hide his sin by sending Uriah to spend the night with his wife. Uriah, though, proving his valor as one of David's mighty men, even though he is a foreigner who has been accepted in the land of Israel, this Hittite mercenary who has served faithfully by David against King Saul, and in a time of fighting the various ites that occupied the land while they were hiding out in the Philistine land, and now one of his most trusted soldiers once again is more righteous than the king. And he answered him, and he said, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my master Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open field. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will do not. I will not do such a thing. Then David said, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah marined in Jerusalem the day and the next, and David invites him to dinner and thinks, I know how to get him to go home. I'll send him home a little tipsy. He ate and drank, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, even in his alcoholic stupor, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat along with his master servants. He did not go home. And now Uriah leaves to head back to the military, and the consequences get even graver because David sends with him a note to give to Joab. And the note said, Put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is the fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. Oh, David develops a plot. David develops a plot to take care of his problem. If he can eliminate Uriah, then perhaps he can solve this problem in a different way. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah in a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and brought fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. This becomes a conspiracy of the gravest order as not only does Uriah die, but the Israelite army faces defeat and loss of many men to cover up the sins of one man. We have a political conspiracy. We have a military cover-up to try to hide what one has done. But everything in Jerusalem looks fine because what happened next is... The grieving widow is invited to be comforted and brought in as one of the many other women. Another sign that we were on a course to sin of David's home. And it appears that the child is the natural outbirth of this new relationship, not the previous relationship. Oh, but there are consequences. David wrote a song about it in his diary, in his psalm journal. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of the summer. Not only do the consequences of this one sin lead to cover-up and death and murder, but there is a spiritual toll taking on the man who has performed all of these actions. But it looks like he's gotten away with it. But then, chapter 11, there's the nosy problem of being a king in a land of prophets who are sent with a message from God. Chapter 12. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, I've got a story to tell you, dear king. Not since, or not until 
Hamlet works with a military troop to point out how his uncle usurped and killed his father. Has anyone told a story that was so effective in convicting a man of his sins? Knowing of David's fondness and past as a shepherd, Nathan tells the story of a shepherd and his sheep. There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and grew up with him and his children. It shared his food and drank from his cup and even slept in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. And David, in his mind, is taken back as that poor son of Jesse who was responsible for taking care of the sheep and thinking of that little sheep that was all his, the one whom he had fed, the one whom he had held at night, the one, and he thought of that relationship and understood and felt for this man in the story. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. Oh, and then David sees the imagery of that mighty flock of sheep that are meant for slaughter and to be what you would use to feed a visitor. But instead, he takes that one precious lamb of the poor little shepherd and he feeds him. And David, in his anger at this story, says, as he burns with his anger of the story, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and he had no pity. And now that David has taken the hook of the story, Nathan the prophet, in ways that only the great Jessica Fletcher or Lieutenant Columbo or... Hercule Perot or Agatha Christie could do it, said, you are the rich man. And the you is the woman who is carrying your child. Oh my. The only hope for David to be able to be cleansed of his sin comes with the fact that Nathan brings the confrontation of the word of God. Now, sometimes our sin needs to be confronted directly. But Nathan was smart enough to know that sometimes it takes the consequences of the indirect confrontation of our sin. Then David comes to the conclusion of what he has done, not because Nathan the prophet waltzed into town and said, God told me you got Bathsheba pregnant and killed Uriah, and now you're going to pay for it. Instead, he was able to use what's known as the inductive reasoning, allowing David to basically confess to his own crime and confess of his own sin which is the beginning for anyone to be able to find forgiveness and be cleansed from sin. The confrontation of the sin, the understanding and the acknowledgement of what we have done. It's also followed by what David did next, where David, instead of trying to hide any more, confesses that you're right. Verse 13, then David said to Nathan, as he hears of the consequences of sin that are going to be brought about, I have sinned against the Lord. Not just because David is told that the consequences of this sin are going to be long lasting upon the throne. There are going to be issues in his family and in his kingdom as a result of this. Not because he tells him of the fact that the child that Bathsheba is carrying will not live. The baby will die very suddenly after childbirth. 
not just because of the understanding of the consequences and the reality of the fact that he is a murderer beyond an adulterer, not only the fact that the king who was supposed to go to war did not go where he was supposed to do. But David also, as he says in Psalm 51, comes to the conclusion that all of these things are a violation of who God is. The violation of God as the creator of sexuality to be contained between the relationship between a man and his wife. He violated it. The consequences of taking and shedding blood intentionally to cover up his sins. It's not just the fact that Uriah died in battle, but Uriah died at the hands or the pen stroke of a king who now is a murderer because of the way in which he died was orchestrated by David. The violation of, one of, of another one of the ten laws, thou shalt not kill. The realization that sin is not just against my own self or against people I hurt, but against God must lead to an understanding that sin therefore must be confessed. It must be a way of the life of the one to be cleansed from sin. First John says it this way, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. And will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. David's understanding of confession and the graciousness and the mercy of God is why even after this account we still refer to David as a great king of Israel. It's why he is mentioned as one of those whom the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 does not have time to go into all of the things he did making him a man of faith. It's why, when you read through the book of Acts, it's one of the three people, along with Abraham and Moses, that the early leaders in the church kept comparing Jesus to, though Jesus is superior and greater. It's why, despite the fact, the same hand that put the quill to the parchment to convict the life of Uriah is the same one who would put the quill to the parchment and write the very psalms that we use to sing this morning in worship to God. Because the hope is that that cleansing is a reality. That doesn't make the consequences of sin go away. The truth of Galatians that what a man reaps he sows is true. David will go into a sense of mourning for the child in its final days before birth and those few hours and days of its early life when he begs and pleads that God would be gracious and change his mind and save this child and the consequences of this action. But the child dies. It does not bring back the life of Uriah or those other mighty men who were killed in battle. It does not probably make a general like Joab not wonder a little bit about how many orders he should trust of the king when he's sent out to the battlefield, when the king is willing to allow some of the best men to be sacrificed, especially when the scandal is made known. But there is hope that this event will not be held against David for the rest of his life. There's the hope that God will again not just give him a steadfast heart and a new spirit within him as we read in Psalm 51. But there's also the hope of the mercy that God promised in the rest of the consequential prophecy of, John, of, of Nathan. Nathan said this in verse 7, You are the man, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed the king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives in your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. 
Why did you despise the word of the Lord by what is doing evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house. Oh, and we'll see that as we look at the rest of David's life next week. Because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite for your own. Then this is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. He will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight. The Lord has taken away your sin. Nathan replied after David's confession. You're not going to die, but because by doing this, you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt. The son born to you shall die. But there's hope that comes. As David and Bathsheba will conceive again. God is merciful to David. They have a son. His name is Solomon. And when we finish next week in 2 Kings chapter 2 with the end of David's life, it is that Solomon who will take the throne. David will pay for his sins and its consequences, but he will also receive mercy and grace from God, the grace of forgiveness, as that contrite and new heart that he asked for is taken away, or is given as his sin is taken away. His desire that his spirit not depart from him, that God not turn him into Saul where he takes the kingdom away is fulfilled by keeping the throne and giving it to Solomon and allowing David's line to stay through Jerusalem in the history of the kings of Israel or at least Judah. And ultimately, Psalm 51 is answered in the hope that David had been given last week in Psalm in 2 Samuel chapter 7. When the story concludes with 14 generations from David to the exile and 14 generations from the exile to Bethlehem, the city of David, where a new chapter was written where the descendant Joseph pledged to a virgin named Mary who would give birth to a child to be named Jesus because he will take away the sins of his people. What David asked for and hoped for in himself, David would become the 28th generation great-grandfather, at least by the account of how Matthew decides to tell the genealogy of the one who not only would blot out and pay for the sins of his great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great, you get it, grandfather David, but also will offer that opportunity to do what David did not ask for of the Lord where he would do even more than you could have ever asked for. See, our mystery or our scandalous story ends in the hope that we all have. In fact, when you look at Matthew's genealogy, he doesn't just put David's name in the genealogy to get to Solomon. He also reminds us that Jesus came out of the fact that David, along with Uriah's wife, begat Solomon. The hope we have in our sin is that somehow God in his grace and his mercy can create a much greater and wonderful story. While it would be good to learn and be warned of the course of David's sin, that maybe in the times where we're not where we're supposed to be, and we ponder the things that do not belong to us or are forbidden to us, 
That by making the decision there, we do not give lust the chance to develop. And when it gives birth, it becomes sin. And it leads to consequences that will drain us of our spiritual strength. And it will leave consequences that we will endure and deal with for the rest of our lives. We also have the hope that besides the course and the consequences is the chance of the cleansing and the forgiveness of our sins. So from Dateline, Jerusalem, our message is a message of scandal and redemption. Maybe today you have followed sin's course. Maybe you're dealing with its consequences, but what you need is to be cleansed from your sins. We offer an invitation as our worship team comes. Let's stand for our invitation.